I'd like to thank again our volunteer crew, our great volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes it all happen. Our guest in this segment is Cameron Moffat. Cameron is an osteopath. Um, I had a, a bicycle bus accident uh, just about a year ago now right. and one of the good things that came out of that was I got we to met. meet Cameron. Yes. Um, so we were going to start to talk about what to do as the weather is changing, but maybe first you can tell us what an osteopath is and does. Certainly. Uh, where osteopath, I guess, differs from a lot of the other um, chiropractic massage physio is I don't treat many symptoms. Um, my main focus is to find the core issue, and I do that by looking at the physiology of the body and also the anatomy of the body. And the two of them are linked very much together. If you have an, an organ that's not functioning properly, um, it'll affect your lower back function. Uh, if you've got a lower back function that's out, you've fallen off a ladder, say, two weeks ago, uh, it can directly affect your kidneys and start messing up your urinary system. Um, so osteopaths look at both structure and function, and we try to bring the body back into its natural ability to heal itself. Again, that's where I guess maybe I'm very similar to um, TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, in the sense that they believe the body can heal itself with the right herbs and the right acupuncture. I do my work very manually, so I don't use needles, I don't use a lot of nutraceuticals, say like a naturopath, but I do manually work on the body. I, I will manually work on the liver, on the stomach, um, on the tailbone, on the spine. Is it, uh, I don't know much about chiropractic, but I understand that chiropractic can be a bit strong. Is osteopathy also strong or more mild? Well, we're trained to adjust joints in that manner. The term is high velocity thrusting. Um, it's not a choice that I make very often, very suddenly. If I do that once a month, that would be a high. There are other ways of adjusting the joint. And um, if you include in the adjustment, if you want to call it that, all the soft tissue around it, so you take that into account, plus any organs and any fascia that are influencing the joint, then when you do eventually move the joint, it's going to stay in place. Um, what people have to remember is bones are inert material. Joints cannot move on their own. So for a joint to go out of alignment, uh, other than being hit by a truck or a baseball bat or something, well, or a bus, um, in the absence of that, then something is pulling the joint out of alignment or allowing it to come out of alignment. And that's what has to be dealt with first in, in my type of training. So I'll start actually with the fourth thing we were going to talk about, which is what, what, what brings people to see you? Um, here in Victoria, um, because I've only been here three years and osteopathy is fairly new in, on the west coast of Canada, um, what usually brings people to see me and other practitioners in the city is frustration. They've already been to see the chiropractor, the massage, the physio, et cetera, and whatever else, and they're not and getting And they're regular anywhere. doctor. And they're, they're doctor, right. Um, so usually it's pain. Um, as the word gets out there more, uh, people are coming in for prevention. They know something's off a little bit. They can feel a bit of a, a nagging lower back, but it's not a big issue, and they come in to see me. And that's how sh the best case scenario. Before it's full-blown pain, then there's a lot more I can do in the initial treatment. Someone comes into the clinic bent over, or they've got a pounding headache, or their, um, their reflux in their stomach has become so acute that their whole upper chest area is inflamed. Uh, I have to deal with that first before you can actually get to the problem. So it takes longer. But uh, usually it's pain. So. Um, is it something like headaches or joint pain or arthritis or? Yep, all of those. Or arthritis is actually a commonly thrown around diagnosis that is often, um, in my opinion, overused. Somebody that's over 40 goes into a healthcare practitioner with uh, sore back, sore uh, elbow, sore shoulder. Um, in the absence of any uh, radiological findings, so there's no fracture, et cetera, et cetera, quite often they'll be diagnosed with, I'm sorry, you've got some arthritis. And we all have you. arthritis after about the age of 30. Our, our, our joints start to wear down a little bit. It's the degree of wear that counts. Um, and quite often when I find people coming in with the arthritic diagnosis, um, they've actually got something else going on. The, quite often it's organ referral. The organs in our body uh, don't speak to us very clearly. Like when was the last time you actually felt your colon or your liver or your gallbladder? But those organs are very awake and present and sending signals all the time to the brain but they do it via the surface of the skin, the outside of the body. So if someone has a, a nagging right shoulder pain that every time they move their shoulder it clicks and grinds, the diagnosis could easily be arthritis. But in fact, 
a large percentage of those cases that I get coming into the clinic are in fact liver issues. Liver refers to the right shoulder. If you've got a pathological liver that's inflamed and irritated, and I don't mean severely to the point where it's a, a severe health problem, but a subtle issue, you'll feel it first in the right shoulder, not the liver. So when people come in with me with right shoulder problems, and I start working on their liver, they quite often will say, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you down here? And once I start to release that whole pattern of dysfunction radiating up, they start to feel their shoulder feeling better, then they understand why I'm working down there. That's amazing. It's, it's different <laughs> and it's fascinating. Yeah. It's very fascinating work. Um, what kind of degree of success do you have with pain? Because I know there's a lot of people uh, who have that problem. I would change the question a little bit as, okay. as a team effort. What do we, what do I and the person I'm working with, what kind of success do we have? I can't do it on my own. Nobody can. There's no, I haven't yet met anybody that's so good in their, their uh, treatments that regardless of the input from the patient, uh, they're going to get better. Um, my success rate is high when I can get that person on board to try to change whatever lifestyle choices they've been making that's got them into the office. If they can change some of those things, then we're well on their way to um, a much better health and better movement and less pain. Okay. So, for example, what would a generalized situation be where someone has pain and comes to see you or another osteopath and you do something that they think has nothing to do with the pain and yet it's successful. What, what would that kind of situation be? The shoulder was one. Sure. Um, well, I think when uh, we discussed um, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the digestive system. Since coming to Victoria, I have noticed a lot more cases coming into my office that are the symptomology is being driven by a dysfunctional uh, digestive system. Um, what I'm starting to realize is that at the southern end of this island, we're surrounded on three sides of a very cold body of water. It's here all the time. I've noticed in the summertime, if I stand out in the sun, it can feel nice and warm. If I step into the shade, it's all of a sudden cool. Right. And so there's this coolness that's always here. And I think a lot of people's digestive systems get very challenged in that dampness. And so example of that is um, somebody's stomach. They've been eating a lot of foods that are cooling. So the person who is on a raw food diet or somebody who's trying to be a vegan and has certain levels of stress in their life, whether it's school or work, or, uh, and they're not meeting the, not so much the calorie intake, but they're not meeting the warmth intake, the need. Their, their digestive fires are getting weakened. When that happens, your stomach, when it gets irritated, refers right between your shoulder blades. So if your listeners, if your viewers happen to notice that they've just had a meal and 20 minutes later, half an hour later, they're getting a stiffness between their shoulder blades and then eventually it radiates up into a headache behind their head, that's their esophagus getting irritated by more than likely what they've just eaten. That's very interesting, I mean the whole thing, but talking about this fact that we have this giant air conditioner, yes. the ocean, all around us because I know in Chinese medicine, coldness within the body can be a serious problem. It's not good. No. It's not good. And coldness, of all, the, of all the situations, coldness in your kidneys is the worst. That's actually um, yes. not life-threatening, but certainly life-joyous threatening. Life. You will, joyous. You will, you will not be functioning well if your kidneys have become very cooled, yeah. very yin. And the other thing to remember is we have a giant glacier just on the other side of the Juan de Fuca in the Olympic Mountains. So even when the wind blows out of California and comes towards us, it goes over top of that glacier and then dumps right into Victoria with that refrigerator. Lucky today on September the 11th, it's about 30 above. Yeah, so it feels great out there happy. today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but winter's coming. So, and that's the first thing we were going to talk about as the weather starts to change mm -hmm. towards fall and winter. Yeah. If people start migrating away from uh, the leafy vegetables, the sun vegetables, if you will, uh, and get more into the root vegetables, more into ginger, more into um, using cinnamon, cardamom, uh, nutmeg. All of those types of spices are very warming. Uh, if someone has a salad, uh, let's say two months from now when it's, we're getting into the rainy season, they really want to eat some greens. Go ahead and have your greens, but make sure some other part of your meal has a lot of warmth to it. And I don't mean temperature warmth, although that's part of it, but the, the warming spices, the warming you know, horseradish, um, wasabi, anything like that will but help. Mustards? Mustards, perfect. And again, so you mentioned we should be eating more ginger? Ginger is wonderful for warming. 
I know in, you mentioned cinnamon. I know in Chinese medicine, cinnamon is one of the most warming of, mm -hmm. of herbs. Mm -hmm. Nutmeg and cardamom. And cardamom, cloves is another one. And you know, I'll just say a word to all the restaurants in town. So many restaurants, when you walk in and sit down, they give you a glass of ice water. Ice water, They're yes. not, you're, you're, you're not doing your customers a favor by doing that. And those of us who are customers, we should, we should say no thanks to the ice water and let's get some just room temperature or even warm water. Yeah, yes? I do. I, I'd never, actually that's another good point um, I'd like to introduce is that uh, drinking with your meals is actually not a great way to health. All you're doing when you're putting liquids into your stomach while you're eating is diluting down the hydrochloric acid. And your stomach basically is a bag of hydrochloric acid and its main function is just to break the food down. The minute you add some fluids in there, with the exception of beer and wine, the minute you add any other fluids in there, you're just watering down the hydrochloric acid and then from there on, either the acid levels get cranked up and you get heartburn or the stomach doesn't do much and the foods leave the stomach poorly broken down and then they've our medical system's got all kinds of names for that. Crohn's colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, um, gastroesophageal reflex, or commonly also known as heartburn. So all of those things will start uh, quite often just by putting liquids in there. So anybody who's having any digestive problems, and if you're not anyways, less fluid, less water, less everything with your meals. Except, I think you said beer and beer wine. Beer and wine. Beer well, and I'm sure a lot of people yeah. are saying, thank <laughs> God for that. Yeah. A glass of beer or a glass of wine, uh, moderate amount, because they're both fermented, they actually will help digestion. Now, distilled alcohol is different. It doesn't have that, that fermented quality to it. But anything fermented, if someone's having some struggles with their digestive system, if every meal they eat something that's fermented, uh, they're well on their way to rehabilitating their, their uh, digestive system. So uh, sauerkraut, um, kimchi, uh, miso, um, property made yogurt, you got to be careful with that one. Uh, the grocery store yogurt's not really, I mean, it's not bad for you, but it's not going to really cut it from a rehabilitative point of view. Um, did I miss anything? Sauerkraut, I think that's it. Those three or four items are quite okay. helpful. So we started to talk a few minutes ago about what to do as the weather changes, and the first thing you mentioned was warmth. Warmth. Is yeah. there anything else you wanted? Um, well, one thing I've been hearing a lot from uh, people coming in the clinic is uh, the smoothie. Um, phenomenon is on us right now and it has been for you know last five or six years people start their day off with with a cold smoothie in the morning which is okay in the middle of summer but not in the winter it's not a great way to start the day that the nutrients are there but it's too cooling so you can either warm the the smoothie up temperature wise or in your smoothie put in some ginger put in some cinnamon what about all the mums and dads who uh, are giving their kids for breakfast as they send them off to school in the morning a glass of cold milk and uh, cornflakes or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, the cornflakes, uh, you're probably better off to dump the cornflakes out and eat the box. Yeah, and I'm just going to repeat that. You're better off to dump the cornflakes out and eat the box At in least terms you know what of you're nutrition. Getting. Yeah, yeah the, the corn's going to be GMO corn, more than likely, and we don't digest corn very well at all. So on top of the cold milk, which is, I'm assuming, been pasteurized and homogenized, that is a product that um, we just do not digest. So what, what should uh, children and, and all of us be eating for breakfast? In, in, uh, uh, like, I like Red River cereal, although I don't sure. eat it for breakfast. I, I like it for lunch or dinner, yeah. or oatmeal, something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. oatmeal, it's warm, um, delicious. Brown rice makes a phenomenal porridge. And then in that brown rice, you can add whatever kind of fruit you want. And you can add the, the spices we just mentioned that are warming. That would be a very, not only temperature warming, but also a heat warming, uh, energy warming food. Yeah. And if you've got young children and they're kind of balking at the, uh, at the flavor of it, put some maple syrup on it or a little bit of honey, some natural sweetener spine. And um, Red River cereal, which is a very cheap thing to buy and very yeah. nutritious, easy to cook. It takes four or five minutes in the morning to it cook. Is. If you add a bit of banana and some raisin or maple syrup, yeah. I mean, I, it's delicious, sure. it's delicious. You yeah. can even make it up the night before if uh, as a family you're rushed in the morning right. and then just simply heat it up again in the, in the morning, it'll be fine. Okay, um, we wanted to talk about proper eating habits which we're touching on now and exercise, so mm -hmm. wherever you want to go. Well, we mentioned about the, um, the, the not drinking with your meal. Start uh, a half an hour before your meal, stop drinking and wait at least a half an hour after meal to resume drinking. The other thing I hear a lot from people is the habit of eating before you go to bed. Uh, within three hours before going down, to lay down, you should stop eating. 
If you don't, I um, mean, I can go through the whole physiology of what happens to the digestive system, but in the end, what you're doing is overloading the kidneys and the liver. And you will not wake up in the morning clear-headed and ready to do the day uh, if you've eaten before you go to bed at night. Your liver is just overloaded all night long, and you'll wake up kind of foggy and grumpy. And what I'm happens so then? sad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the other thing too is right, coffee. Though. I'm not. Do you drink much coffee? No. <laughs> Nothing wrong with coffee. The cameraman right there drinks a lot, more oh. than I do. Well, that's why his hair is so curly. <laughs> uh, coffee in itself is fine, but when people mix it with a meal, because coffee is such a metabolic stimulant, it speeds everything up in the stomach and you do not digest your food very well at all when it's mixed with food. From a nutritional point of view, if you're putting coffee and food together, you may as well just go to McDonald's. You're not getting much out of your food. So when I sit in nice restaurants and I see people having a beautiful, you know, range-raised, uh, happy, organic meal, and then they put coffee on top of it, it's like, ah, you just lost it. So you mean it just changes the metabolic... It just pushes it through too quickly. Oh, okay. As well as it's, okay. uh, coffee is a very strong diuretic. Okay. For every one cup of coffee you drink, you lose two cups of water in your urine. And a lot of people coming into the office with back pain, headaches, they're just simply dehydrated. Okay, so I think, like, for, for me, you know, I'm not unhappy with my health. I ha have all the bad habits you've just been talking about, but I'm not too worried about it. But somebody who is having health problems, then they should really be looking at sure. these things because it's a first step that anybody can take. And right. Or why wait until you end up in my office with a digestive problem? Just make a few changes now and you're even yep. healthier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we covered just, to, oh, exercise. Exercise. You actually wanted to ask me about uh, vaccines and x-rays. Do we have time for Vaccines that? and x-rays. We've got about one minute, unfortunately. Yeah. One, one minute. minute. One minute. Um, the amount of, the amount of um, uh, radiation you're getting in an x-ray is, is minimal nowadays. It's not a big deal. If you have one x-ray three times a year, not a big deal. Um, the equipment nowadays is actually very minimal in its exposure. Um, vaccines, uh, I've raised two children. One of them had no vaccines. It's a personal choice for a parent, and it's a very hard choice for a parent to decide which way to go. But one thing that does not make sense to me is to vaccinate a child before one year. Uh, their immune system is still developing, majorly developing, in the first six to eight months. And then to hit it with a, um, an outside influence, as in a vaccine, uh, that to me I think is dangerous. And I think they're starting to link a lot of this now with the possibilities of autism. Cameron Moffat, thank you very much for doing this. It was fascinating. Yes, I enjoyed it again. And thank you. thanks, everybody, for watching this.